there's a lot to be said about a nice rest, a time of rest. Uh, you know, to go without resting is a very, very difficult thing to do. And we work hard and we put our hands to the plow. We do what God has set before us to do. And sometimes we get to the point where we think, you know, rest, who, who's rest? I don't even, I'm not familiar with that really at all. You know, almost half of Americans, the studies have shown that they feel sleepy during the day, at least three times a week, even if not as many as seven times, uh, seven days a week. And it's amazing to me that 69% of men and 76% of women wake up each night when they're in a nice deep sleep just to go to the bathroom. Gosh, what a terrible thing. I also have seen studies that have shown that women have a lifetime risk of insomnia that is 40% higher than men. Now, if you're a married man here today, you probably have just had a light bulb go off in your head. You know, for me as a man, I can fall asleep anywhere. I can fall asleep on a plane, in a chair, leaning against that wall. I can fall asleep. I just have a switch and I can flip it and I'm off. But, you know, there are times that I go to bed, my wife and I, Ruth and I, have been married 17 years and have four kids, but it's never ceased to amaze me how when I go to sleep, I can hear Ruth thinking. And it's the funniest thing because I'll say, babe, can you please stop thinking so I can go to sleep because I can hear and I can feel your mind moving. But, you know, there's a lot to be said for a good rest. But I wonder if you've ever found yourself in a place of exhaustion that goes deeper than a physical exhaustion. It's a deep, deep weariness of the soul. It's more than those of you that are in school pulling all-nighters and studying or you parents being up with your kids if they have the flu. It's a deep exhaustion. And there are many things that we carry around as men as burdens and often we're afraid to discuss them or even to admit that we might be struggling We have stress at our jobs. We have maybe an argument with our spouse. Maybe it's coming to the end of the month as now we have turned the calendar to June and, you know, trying to meet our sales quotas before the end of our period. Maybe it's a diagnosis that one of our family members just received. Maybe it's paying bills. And we can carry a lot of burdens. And this is even for the seasoned Christian. We've had men that have come forward to receive the Lord. We've had men that have responded that they want to press forward. But what about the seasoned men that are just going through a difficult time? What about the burdens that you're carrying? What if you're grieved in your spirit and you're carrying burdens spiritually? I wonder if there are some of you here today that during the sessions that we've already had have rejected the Word of God being spoken to you. Maybe your heart was beating out of your chest when Pastor David gave an invitation for you to come forward to receive Jesus and you rejected it. Maybe you were like Butch who was sharing that the message that you, messages that you've been hearing were for somebody else. Like, that's for the guy next to me or behind me. It's definitely not for me. See, our choices have consequences that accompany them. And those consequences arrive physically where they can drain you. They have mental and emotional consequences as well, but ultimately, spiritually. See, Jesus said in Matthew 11, verses 29 through 30, He said, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. And you might be thinking that if you have enough money in your bank account, that'll bring you the rest that you need. That if you have peace in certain relationships, then that'll give you the rest that you need. That if you can get the promotion at your job, or if you can get through this next week, then you'll get the rest that you need. But the rest that you're truly seeking for can only be found in Jesus Christ. And in the study and context of this letter that I'm going to be sharing to you from the book of Hebrews, the author had already established that Jesus was greater than Moses because Jesus created Moses. Jesus built the house of Moses and gave Moses His law. 
And Jesus was ultimately the fulfillment of the law of Moses. And the law pointed out that you had a need for a Savior. Trial in the wilderness. Back in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, it says, God, who at various times has spoken in times past, he has spoken in such a way through the fathers and the prophets. It says, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. And today you're going to hear various speakers from various backgrounds, various messages. But the common thread throughout is the Holy Spirit speaking through His living Word. And it's important for you as a follower of Jesus today to know that God is speaking. That He is moving by His Spirit. He is speaking if you would only just listen to Him. And it may even be today that as you came in through these doors into the sanctuary, that the burdens that you carried in with you today will be the very thing that causes you to even be open to God ministering to you in a very special way. But see, when it comes to God revealing who He is to you, and you might be fluent in Christianese, You might know the songs and when to raise your hands and you know the books of the Bible. But do you know the voice of the Lord? Do you hear Him speaking to you? Because when it comes to God revealing Himself to mankind, there are only, and He makes it very simple, there are only two options through which mankind may may react. Number one, it is you hear His voice. Number two, You harden your heart to His voice. And some of you have gone down the path of hearing His voice for so long and you've said no time and time again and now you are arriving at the place of hardening your heart to the voice of the Lord. See, when God speaks to us as men, He speaks to us through His Word and then the Holy Spirit ministers to our spirit. Jesus spoke of the work of the Holy Spirit in John 16, verse 13. I'll read it to you. It says, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. And so the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart. It speaks to the heart of man's nature, man's needs. You know, often, and I find myself guilty of this, that I'll seek a quick fix of my physical situation, the environment that I'm in. Lord, just get me out of this situation. But God actually knows that me getting out of this situation is not what's best for me. What I need is a touch from the Holy Spirit. And so often we pray, Lord, get the man out of the situation. When the Lord really is saying, I'm going to change the man inside the situation. And see, with sin, it is a burden that's greater than any of us are meant to bear. The burden of regrets over sinful actions. It wears on a person's conscience. It wears away at spiritual health. And you cannot be in a worse position spiritually than to be spiritually dead in your trespasses and in your sin. What has the Lord been revealing to you? What truths from God's Word has He spoken to you that you have seemingly become inoculated to? Heard that before. What has the Lord been impressing upon your heart that you have hardened your heart towards Him? You've hardened your heart towards Him because you haven't received it. And when you read from verses 7 and 8, will you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit convicting you or will you harden your heart towards Him? Will you exercise your faith or will you fight against the work of the Holy Spirit? You've been given the freedom to do both. You can choose one or the other. But you have to decide for yourself as your own man. Not because your wife pressured you. 
Not because you're going to try to fix something real quick because, you know, oh, this is my quick fix to get out of this situation. I'll just give my life to the Lord. Or, you know, I'll pray to God if you save me, then maybe I'll do this. No, this is a real, real decision set before you today that whether you've grown up in the church or not or don't know the first thing about it, that God has already been moving by His Holy Spirit and you either receive the Word of God or you reject it. And so where are you at today? Because every time we as men harden our hearts against the things of the Lord, every time we reject the work of the Holy Spirit convicting us of our sin or pointing out our need for a Savior, we are hardening our hearts. Every time you hear the truth of God's Word and you say, no, 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 you're hardening your heart. And I wonder if there are some of you sons in here today who have godly dads. Maybe you know their story. Maybe you've seen the bad side of what they were like apart from Christ. And now here they are having experienced the things of the world and now are trying to save you from that same pain. But you're like, "Uh uh-uh, no, Dad, no. I kind of got to live my own life and make my own decisions. And yeah, that's true. you got to be your own man. And you're going to make your own choices. But it's been said that a wise man learns from other people's mistakes, a smart man learns from his own mistakes, and a stupid man learns from neither. And that is true. I might just need to let that simmer a little bit. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. Your dads love you. Maybe you got a father figure in your life, or an uncle, or a grandpa. Saying, son, this is not the way you want to be walking. You might think this is cool. You might think this is what it means to be a man. But the best definition, the best definition of a man's man is found in Jesus. The best definition of a man is found in a a man that is flawed like we are. But it said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Lord, I have made mistakes. And sometimes, you know, we don't think we can speak into our kids' lives because we've made mistakes. And it's one of the greatest attacks of the devil because he'll say, how are you going to say that they shouldn't be doing that when you've already done it, you hypocrite? But the best way to conquer that is to take responsibility for your actions and you say, it was wrong when I did it and it's wrong now if you're doing it. And you own those mistakes. But for you young men, don't harden your hearts to the voice of the Lord even speaking through godly role models that you have. Because it's especially painful when you choose, when you know the truth, and you've been taught it, when you choose to reject it, when you've already experienced the goodness of God, and you've hardened your heart for the future work of the Holy Spirit in you and through you. So your experience through faith in Jesus with the Holy Spirit, that's not just a one-time thing. That's not, oh, I got my ticket punched. It's a constant process of the Lord sanctifying you and molding you and shaping you into the man that He has created you to be. For the Jews in Jerusalem that this letter of Hebrews was written to, and then even for you and me today as students of the Old Testament as well, we're reminded of the great travesty that their forefathers endured just because they hardened their hearts against the Lord. Who can stand against God? In Malachi chapter 3, verses 2 through 3, it says, But who will be able to endure it when he comes? Who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? For he will be like a blazing fire that refines metal, or like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. He will sit like a refiner of silver, burning away the dross. And it goes on to say, He will purify the Levites, refining them like gold and silver, so that they may once again offer acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. Why would we not want to find the rest that we're looking for? Some of us think, well, I can rest when I'm retired. I can rest when I'm dead. We're not talking about a rest from your labor. We're talking about the peace that Jeff Stroker talked about when he was in Somalia. We're talking about a peace that surpasses all understanding. It guards your heart. It guards your mind. 
And there is such a relief that comes spiritually when your sins are forgiven and you have a hope in heaven. When you find that because of your faith in Jesus that there is now no more condemnation. You're not condemned. You're forgiven. You're cleansed. You're made new in Christ. And you find that following Jesus, though the difficulties in this world and the tribulations in this world still may remain, that you find that you have rest in your soul. God's peace. Come to Jesus, all you who are weary and heavily burdened. Don't rebel against the Lord. We're not promised tomorrow. You're here now with your current situation in life. With everything that has been spoken and communicated through the Word of God up until this point has been directly from the Lord, been given from the Lord to you. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, it says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, we see that that first king of Israel was rejected from being king. Rebellion. Fighting against the work of the Holy Spirit. Becoming hard hearted. Where you're like the Teflon man and the truth of the Holy Spirit just bounces right off of you. Uh uh, not making its way to my heart today. Because you've heard it and you've rejected it. The people that were under Moses of which Hebrews 3 is referring to, they were the ones that hardened their hearts against the work of the Lord. In Psalm 95, verse 7 through 11, it says, For He is our God, and we are His people of His pasture, the sheep of His hand. Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, the Lord says, they tried me, they saw my work. And for 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said it is a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Now you can pretend that your life is all great. You can pretend that everything's well put together. You can come in looking as if you have no problems. And you may be an expert at that. But the Bible is very, very clear that if you are hardening your heart towards the things of the Lord, regardless of your external appearance, that you will find your rest gone. And it's such a tragedy to see men that have all the potential in the world that God has pulled out of this world and said, I have set you on a solid path and I have prepared you for great things, but you never ever realize that God-given potential because you harden your heart to the things of the Lord. You allow secret sin. You say, no, that's for somebody else. It's not for me. And you never enter His rest. It's heartbreaking. Like the people in Exodus that are spoken of in verse 9 here in Hebrews, it says, Where your fathers tested me, they tried me, they saw my works 40 years. Therefore I was angry with that generation and said they always go astray in their heart. And they have not known my ways. And so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. It was an issue of their hearts. How can our churches across America, and let's even just look at California, be filled with some of the largest churches in the United States, and we live in a wicked, wicked state? Where are the men that say, I actually put faith and action together? Where is it when the War is raging that we stand in the gap and we say, not on my watch. Where are the men that are actually saying, I believe it, and then going out and living like it? 
We need that. The Lord said they won't enter to my rest because their hearts have strayed from me. And I think that a lot of our congregations might be slightly inflated with men that say, Lord, Lord, but don't go out and do the will of the Father. And may that not be the case for any of us. Faith comes through hearing and hearing through the Word of God. But what about your communion? Your fellowship with the Lord? What about the time that you spend in prayer? We say, I want to press on. I want to move forward. I want to let go of that which is behind and I want to reach for that which is ahead. But how am I going to do that if I don't know the one that I'm reaching forward to? If I haven't spent time with Him to hear that which I should be striving for, that which I should try to obtain, how do I know what being holy as He is holy means if I don't understand what His Word says? We heard, shared, you may have started off poorly, but you can finish well. And that's just a powerful testimony to the fact that God can take any man at any time and use him in any way and say, I have made you now a new creation. And I think we heard that very clearly communicated. That's not what I'm going to talk about right now. What I'm going to talk about is those of you that started well but are ending poorly. Galatians 3.3 says, Are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? You were on fire and you were doing everything that you knew that God was calling you to do, but now you're kind of coasting. It's just part of your routine now. You know, this is just kind of what I do, but your heart is drifting. See, the people of Israel were known for going astray in their hearts. They were known for not knowing the ways of the Lord. And then number three, were known for not experiencing the rest that comes from the Lord. And it's impossible. And you might think, well, my heritage is rich. You know, my life-changing experience with God was miraculous. The things that I was doing is, were just so on fire. But are you looking back at your life and looking and saying, all the great things that God was doing is behind me. And He's not doing that now. And it doesn't seem like He's going to do that in the future. It's a slow drift. It's a hardening of the heart. And the soul that sins, if you're apart from Christ, will surely die. You'll not experience the blessings and the life and the rest that comes from the Lord unless you give your life to Him. But I'm also speaking now to the church like you men. Are you comfortable? Is it as if David is staying home from battle? I think I'll take this one off. See, the caveat for finding rest for our weary soul and forgiveness of our sins and spiritual life is found in verse 12 where he says, Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you with an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. An evil heart of unbelief. See, the Holy Spirit cannot comfort the unbeliever. The Holy Spirit cannot comfort those that are hardening their hearts. The Holy Spirit cannot comfort those that are ungodly or without faith in Jesus. Do we understand that today? Isaiah 57.20 says, But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. But it's not until Jesus says, Peace, be still. Do you find that peace? See, an unbelieving heart is a departing heart. 
And I was thinking through this as I was praying over this message. And you're like, do you go with the Philippians 3 thing? No, I'm for sure Pastor David's going to speak on Philippians 3. But it was Titus. I was like, interesting. But this passage in Hebrews, I felt was so led by the Lord and that if we are going to press on, we must keep doing what God has called us to do, but be aware of a hardening heart. And I can't press on and I can't go forward if I am departing from my first love. And when our hearts are on a departure from the things of the Lord, so too will be the peace and the rest and the comfort that comes from Him. And today, anything that you thought was a middle ground, there is no such thing as middle ground. There never has been. We thought there was a gray area, but there is never a gray area. It was either black or white, in or out, right or wrong. And we're seeing this now come full circle where it's either righteousness of God or it's the unrighteousness of sin. And today, and maybe I'm fired up because I have four kids that I'm trying to protect, and there is such a war over the hearts and minds of our kids to win them over, the world to win my kids over to their belief system. There is a perversion, and I believe it's a demonic perversion, at work in the hearts of our youth to get them, get them to the place where they depart from the faith that they were raised in through their unbelief. We need the men of the church to act like men. We need to be strong and courageous, to be bold, to do what nobody wants to do. We need to, we need to fulfill that responsibility. We need to stand for what is right. We need to train up our kids in the way that they should go so when they're old, they won't depart from it. We need to be those role models. But we also have to watch our own hearts because if we are going to be effective in this warfare, if we are going to continue to press forward, we have to realize that it may not just be the onslaught of in-your-face kind of attacks from Satan. It could be a simple little compromise here. A simple just changing of my schedule because, you know, I don't really have time to read or pray. You know, I'm, um, and you start to find that your heart becomes hardened and you start to drift off. In Hebrews 11.6 it says, But without faith it's impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And if the devil knows that without faith in Jesus, it's impossible to please the Lord and that God's rest will not fall upon those who are in rebellion against the Lord, don't you think that the devil would love to keep people trapped in the misery of their sin? Keep them in a place where God will judge them. It's impossible to please the Lord without faith. And sin, guys... As a pastor, I have to guard my own heart against these things. I've heard that story so many times taught. I've heard that passage explained so many times. But I tell you, when I was sitting there in that pew in the front row for all of these sessions, it was just like a kid again. I want to hear the Word of God taught. I want to receive what the Lord, the Lord has to tell me through His Word because sin isn't just a blatant disregard for the commandments of the Lord. It's also the blatant ignorance that comes from a warped sense of self-righteousness that leads you to depart from faith in Jesus. We're now kind of just going to make it on my own, own steam. Because sin is very, very deceitful. Look will catch you coming and going. And for this reason, we read of the importance of the church doing what it's supposed to do. And in verse 13 he says, But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Pastor David touched on this about having a band of brothers. Having a church, having Christian friends that can encourage you during your times of struggle is such a blessing. To have men that say, hey, come with me, or hey, I'm heading in this direction, go with me. To be able to be a role model and also to be able to be mentored by someone. 
Because sin, the end result of it is to get you to a place where you are established and you are set in the rebellion of your ways. Even something as simple as, a, you know, I'll get right with God tomorrow. Or, you know, I'll take care of that next week. Or, you know, I'm going to get around to fixing that. Or to ignore something that the Bible specifically says is wrong. See, when you're a part of a healthy body of Christ, when you have brothers, that's why I encourage you, be in men's ministry. When you have brothers that are around you, they save you from going weird. And it's true. You start to go weird and somebody knows the Bible and knows you and loves you. It's this quick, psh, what are you thinking, man? Oh, thanks, sorry, I didn't realize. Accountability, iron sharpening iron. And where the Holy Spirit is moving through the living Word, there is conviction and there is exhortation. And there are people that are living out their faith. But see, the impetus is always upon the individual today. Today. You can't go back and change the past and you're not guaranteed tomorrow. But what you do have right now is the present. This is what you have. And so while you have today, do what is right before the Lord. While it is today, encourage someone in their faith. While we are alive and breathing, Share the gospel with someone. Just this last week, Sharon, we remembered Sharon Reese and her passing, Rawls' wife. And Ryan's been a friend of mine for a long time. And it was it was probably one of the most brutal memorials I had to go to is seeing friends that are hurting so bad. And I woke up the day afterwards, and I don't know if it was just subconscious stress or hurting because you have friends that are hurting. And I woke up, and it felt like my whole life flashed before my eyes. It was, it, it was like from when I was a kid, you know, jumping off the roof into the pool, and my brothers in school, and my parents, and my mom, and my dad, and my grandparents, and, you know, friends that I've lost, and all of this stuff, it just hit me. And it got to the point where it was overwhelming, and I'm like, what's going on? Like, I'm laying there at 6 a.m. in the morning, and, I, and, and I'm just, I'm wrestling with this. I'm like, what's happening to me? I mean, am I going, am I having a breakdown? <laughs> you know, like, what's going on? Am I midlife crisis? What is this? But what it was, was the reality of life and how it doesn't last for very long setting in. How in a blink of an eye, life comes and goes. My little baby that I raised as my first son be 18 years old in two years, if you remember Hudson. My dad gave me this reality check and he said, do you realize in 16 years you'll be 60? (laughs) What? I'm not ready to be that. Age yet. Wait, what? What's going on? And all of a sudden. And even this verse that we're looking at today, today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, exhort one another today while you have today. I'll call them next week. I'll apologize later. There is such a power. Listen to what I'm about to say because it's probably going to be like, did he make a mistake? No, I did not. There is such power a power in unbelief. Because unbelief has the power to rob you of everything that God has for you. And so today, today, we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it is said, today if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. See, the beginning of your faith, that's your past. The end of your faith is the future, and we cannot bridge the both without our faith today. 
If your heart has become callous to the things of the Lord, the Lord can soften it. If you have been dismissive of your studies through the Word of God because, oh, I've read that passage before, the Lord can show you something in a new way. None of us have arrived. The emphasis is placed upon us today. What will we do with what God has told us today? We may have not have listened to God yesterday or even earlier this morning, but what are we doing right now? What will you do with God's truth today? Well, you might be worried and you say, well, you know, how am I going to keep my faith in the future? Well, very simply, you keep your faith in the future moving forward if you keep it today. One day at a time, you get up, you honor the Lord with what he has entrusted you with, and you say, Lord, not my will, your will be done. And so this call, as I close, is for anyone that might have been in a place where you've become numb to hearing the same things already from the Lord. I've heard it before. And I said no back then, and I'm saying no again now. Even if you're saying, well, you know, I'm open to it, but I am not going to choose today. Well, to choose to not obey the Lord is to make a choice to disobey Him. To not choose to do the right thing is to choose to do the wrong thing. And so for the men of the church... If you've gotten to a point in your life where you hit some stagnation, where you are in this place where you're not really on fire, you're not really cold, but you're lukewarm. We know how Jesus feels about that. And that's the last thing that any of us should be.